but everything was ready for a close-up. So when you went into those bays, you were everything on those pinned walls, like family photos, little notes. Oh my God, the cutest shit that I always wanted to steal. And then I realized, I was like, no, everybody is stealing it. And we have to keep coming back in here and put it in. But the detail of everything, the post, it's like everything. I even opened drawers and there was yeah. files ready in the drawers. Yeah. Like, I thought I was going to catch them there. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name's Pete Hammond. I'm going to moderate tonight. And uh, how did you all like Bombshell? Is that, that's a hell of a movie, yeah? All right. We, as you can tell, have a very big panel here tonight. Uh, this is an all-guild screening, and we've got an all-guild panel. Uh, so first off, I want to introduce the supervising sound editor, Renee Tondelli. And he is the composer in so many great movies, Theodore Shapiro. Please welcome the set decorator, Ellen Brill. And the production designer, Mark Ricker. And a film editor, John Paul. And it's Oscar winning writer, he's also a producer on it, Charles Randolph. And uh, Emmy winning director, he's also a producer on it, Jay Roach. Need an introduction from me, Margot Robbie. And she not only stars as Megan Kelly, but she's also a producer on the film. Please welcome Charlize Theron. Well, congratulations, guys. This is uh, one of the very early screenings of, of this movie. Uh, you're just getting out there, but already the buzz is, is great on it. And what a project, Charlize, to take on, though. Uh, were you, when you first heard about this, was this something you said, yeah, I'm going to do it? Or did you think, mm, maybe I'm not going to do it? <laughs> I know. I, I mean, I, I am a huge fan of Charles's writing, and so I knew it was going to be something really amazing. And, and you know, strangely, I thought like I, I kind of know everything that happened with that. And then I read the script and obviously realized that I had forgotten a lot of stuff. But the script was just spectacular and um, felt so timely that for our, our company, it just felt like a no-brainer to want to produce it. That's Denver and Delilah. Production. That's Denver and Delilah. Yes, AJ and Beth are in here somewhere. But I. It took a little longer to get around playing Megan. Yeah. It's a phenomenal performance. There is no question about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. To the point when I saw it the other night, I, I turned to my wife and I go like, uh, I thought they weren't using Megan Kelly footage or anything here. I thought it was just you. And, I, and it was just you. But I just was floored. I mean... You had her down, but you had the essence of her, which I thought was really important here. Thank Making you. her human, everybody here, you know. Coming from you, that is so fucking huge, so thank you. <laughs> how did you, uh, did you, you never met with her when you did this, or um, how, did, how did it go? No, I didn't. I, I just, I, I love research. I love it, you know, that we get to learn crazy skills, like playing tennis or driving cars. Like, you know, our job allows us to, like, go for three months and learn a skill. Um, and I love that. Like, I'm a little obsessive, compulsive, and I love the idea of just digging into something and just staying there and 
So the research part of it I really enjoyed. I have a great team. I work with an incredible dialect coach, Carla Meyer, who just spent hours with me, hundreds of hours. Um, and then I spent a lot of time with um, Kazuhiro, who's just a fucking rock star. And he's such an artist. He did the prosthetic works, work in our movie, not just for me, but for John and Nicole and a lot of other people. Um, and he just, I just loved spending time with him because it was through him and through Carla that I really, you know, and Colleen Atwood with the costume design and everybody here on the stage and a lot of you who are on our movie who are here that I heard were here, you all elevate us to a place that we can't go on our own. And so my process is shared with so many people and I've never been able to climb that mountain by myself. So a lot of this is because of a lot of other people working incredibly hard with me and with Jay and with everybody. Well, it works. <laughs> Thank you. It was my long-winded thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and for Margo, you're playing the fictionalized character who's really a composite of a lot of people that the filmmakers uh, interviewed here to get their story here, but who through NDAs or other reasons can't tell it themselves. So that's an interesting kind of part to play and walk into this movie and be, you know, the amalgamation as it were. Uh, what was your feelings about that when you... Uh, or approach to play uh, Kayla. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've played real life people before and I've played fictional characters before and I always feel a sense of responsibility to the character whether they're real life people or not. Um, but there was obviously a very unique sense of responsibility around playing Kayla that I hadn't experienced before and that was a responsibility to tell the story of multiple women who can't tell their story or have chosen not to for their own individual reasons and I um, I'm, I I did absolutely feel the liberty to create a character and I did that with these guys and and um, but but there was a ton of uh, stuff I could already go off. Sadly, there was a ton of stuff I could already go off. And I, I grew up in Australia. I didn't grow up watching Fox News. So even just to go back and understand what that platform is. Close and, enough, Rupert Murdoch. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's doing other stuff than us. Um, but, you know, yeah, it was fascinating. And, and like Shelley said, the research is one of the most rewarding parts of this, and I had a lot to do. But uh, more than anything, I felt res a great sense of responsibility in Kayla. Did you talk to uh, many of the women yourself uh, during the course of this? I, per I didn't personally. Um, the filmmaking team spent a lot of time with those women and those women and I uh, was recounted all of that and of course there's a lot of research and uh, stuff available um, to you without that but I spoke to a lot of women I know uh, who've experienced not something specific at Fox News but um, I know uh, actually almost every single woman I know has a story about sexual harassment to some degree of severity and uh, even doing a film like this, people suddenly feel, uh, you know, compelled to talk to you about it, which has been really amazing. And I've just had, even before I started saying I'm, I'm researching this at the moment, I've had so many uh, people close to me that I didn't even have any idea, you know, want to want to share their story. And that's just been a really, um, yeah, fascinating and and touching part of this whole journey. And you know, I. The one scene, one scene that I recall, uh, it was so horrifying when, when Holland Taylor, who is like the real facilitator here, brings you in. That was haunting right there at that brief moment. And then you're in that office and, and that scene, watching that play out, it is just horrifying. Just yeah, I, I so respected the choice Charles and Jay made to stay in that room for as long as you stay in that room, because I think in less brave hands, they would have left the audience, let the audience off the hook, you know, they would have, you would have closed the door and as an audience member you'd be like, okay, I know what's happening in there and oh, I want to get out of it and I want to go do something else, right, I want to see something else, I don't want to think about that too long. And I think it was so incredibly brave and potently powerful to say, no, you're going to sit in this room with her for another three minutes, even after this has happened, and you are going to stay in this room as long as she's staying in this room. 
and yeah. that was um, I just think as soon as I read that screen I was at that scene I was just like wow they they are um, you know brave filmmakers really brave yeah. filmmakers and he's not here but uh, a shout out to John Lithgow who's yeah. terrific in this film <laughs> he's the nicest human being on the planet like, there is no one I would be I thought that was me <laughs> The second nicest human being on the planet. There is no one I would rather do that scene with than John. Truly, that he is, he's just incredible and very, made me feel so safe. Yeah. yeah. Jay, um, a terrific job here. Now, Jay has done, Yay. yes. <laughs> Jay's done, as I call them, ripped from the headlines movies before, like Recount and Game Change and things. And what made you want to dive into this particular uh, subject matter? Uh, how did you get involved? Uh, the script was amazing, so that was that made it easier. Uh, Charlize sent it to me, which was the second amazing thing that came at me right away. So I had two things that were almost undeniable just there, but the content meant a lot to me and uh, I know a lot of women who've suffered a lot and I, I just, it was very moving and I, and I, when I first read it I didn't know I was going to be up for direct that I just was giving Shelly some notes as a friend and she said, oh, that's interesting, why don't you direct it? And I was, that was very, it was hard to say no to that. Um, but I, I just found the predicament, I, a lot of what I care about when I'm making films is that, that it hold your attention just from the, oh my God, how's that going to work out? I've often said on all of these films, I wish I was in that room when Roger Ailes is watching Megyn Kelly bust Donald Trump for saying horrible things about women on, on the debate that he's sponsoring and realizing, uh-oh, I've got the star of my network going up against my ratings cash cow. How's that going to work out? And just like, and then hearing how Gretchen Lynette choosing you know, all alone to take him on um, and spent a year collecting things and then brings him down in the, in the GOP convention, which I was at. I was there doing research. Um, so I want to be in those rooms and figure how they navigated those predicaments. And Fox was unique in its, its a, a systematic attack on women who dared step forward. And they, you really found that out through Gretchen doing it because they just, as you saw in the film, even the women turned on her, but the whole the whole mechanism was to. So it was this incredible, uh, you know, David and Goliath story, and so it was. It really was irresistible to me from from the first read of, of his amazing script and, and knowing that Charlize wanted to do it. And then once we, the cast that we assembled, you know, the calls Charlize made, the calls we all, you know, that and to have Margot and Nicole and John and. Connie Britton and Alison Janney and Kate McKinnon and just like the wall, we had a wall of people that we, we had that we just would walk in and go, Are we, is this gonna, I hope this happens. <laughs> this is a lot of great people. So that right was, down to the smallest role, yeah. you know, I mean, who plays Janine Pur Puro? So that's um, Alana Eubach, who She's, is one of the great, who is, I mean, if you've seen Euphoria, just shows you the range, she plays the the alcoholic mother in Euphoria, and in my film Meet the Fockers, she was Ben Stiller's baby mama that had the illegitimate, what we thought was the illegitimate child, that is uh, Isabel, you know, who's a really hilarious, she's amazing. But they're she all She worked them. so hard, too. I know. Because we, that we, character is so yeah, tricky. It's so hard. It's so, uh, how, how much, if you get too much yeah. like her, that almost sounds looks like you've gone too far, you know, and so we had to scale back from, to, to be authentic, to have it seem authentic, because people wouldn't have necessarily bought it. So true, but she just stuck with it. She just, she she just, just, just stayed it. in there, yeah. But every, every one of those gods who played every role was really going for it. And I was thinking about this, it's just to talk about this amazing crew, one of the people who's not here tonight is Barry Aykroyd, and the way Barry shoots, um, where the camera, it's was, it was almost always, oppositional camera shooting, you're, I, and I would tell the actors, you know, you're never not going to be on camera. And they were always 100%, in which I used to shoot just one direction and the other direction. And off camera, people would be good, but they would sometimes, you'd tell they were holding something a little back, you know, to when you turn around. 
And the timing was always hard to get right, and you have to rely on my great editor's skills to get the timing back in shape. Here, it's happening. It's happening live. You're in every scene, that scene with, with Kayla and Ro, I was in the room on that third camera, actually. Just, I felt like I was in the most intense, dramatic play, you know, play. Like it was, so that, that's how the crew worked the whole time. We were always on. Everybody was always on, always had to be up, and that's, that was the cast, but we were all had to hustle too, and there was just this, a feel of how important what we were doing was and how we had to get it right, and it was, it was really um, an astonishing crew and cast to work with. So. Amen. Yeah. Did you get any cooperation from Fox News at all? I mean, you use a lot of the logos and a lot of the... Uh, what, what's your, what do you think? <laughs> I, I, you either stole it, which was fine with me. There, but. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting part of what I do, what we do when we make films like this, is that um, there's a fantastic sort of legal um, justification for something called fair use, which means as long as you're using it to tell an authentic version of the story and you're sticking to it and you actually have to use all the real bugs and the real we used to think we had to fake all the logos you have to actually be sure you're matching everything as long as you're authentic and you're doing a story that has some claim to being in the public to the public's benefit you can use that stuff without permission you can't use a lot of it you can't you know over commercialize the use of it but you're allowed to use it for free and you even and you often have to because you're never going to get somebody like Fox News to uh, to clear it for you. So that's all fair use, as they call it. That is even on Fox and Friends, where you stuck Nicole Kidman in the middle Absolutely. of the real guys. And again, as long we used her actual wardrobe and we matched everything about it, the lighting, every aspect of it. And as long as you can demonstrate you're going for the purely authentic version, you're allowed to do that. Wow. Charles, uh, this is a wonderful script. Again, you won the Oscar for The Big Short. You're, you're diving into these very complex topics of real life that people may or may not know, and there's a lot of pressure there to get it right. So what was your thinking when you came upon this and decided to write this script? Oh, um, well, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by gender politics, and I believe that, you know, the best thing I can do for men is to put them in rooms with people like Kayla, you know, and put them inside that emotional experience. They so genuinely feel what that's like. You can't be minimalized. So part of it's that you're looking for those kinds of stories, but but also this one just, I mean, these women were so complex and contradictory. Um, and you know, I mean, my favorite response to this movie is, "Damn it, why did you make me feel empathy?" Megan Kelly, right? You know, that that sentiment that people have, right? And that's and that's that's fantastic because it's a, it's an issue that a transcends partisanship, but also it's just it, what it does is it it you know it, it, it suggests that the underlying human being that's being portrayed is someone interesting and engaging, and they were all all the way down from you know from from Megan all the way to to people you know uh, people who are just have one or two lines. They're they're an interesting, but such a fascinating cast of of characters in a, in a in a world that's that's very different than than the one that I occupy. So it's engaging. You mentioned men that it, that it's important for men to see this. You know, people we know all the stars, and it's all about what happened to the women there. But that men will see this movie and maybe see things a little differently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, that's something that's we've all expressed. Every I think everyone on this stage went into this project with that hope and, and it created real unity I have to say it was you know it was, it was one of those lovely sets in part because that's the sort of set Jay Brooks runs he's not going to run anything but that but but you know in, in general it was it was it was lovely how everyone sort of felt like they were there to do something a little bit more than their normal job because of the subject matter that was, that was terrific um, he mentioned damn it making Megan Kelly empathetic but you did, and it's a very complex and complicated performance and a complicated person. She was stuck between this tremendous ambition she had and a growing sense of moral uh, responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> um, she was probably the hardest char character outside of, uh, it's so different, but it's like, you know, I thought I knew a lot about her, but I really didn't, right? So what I knew was just kind of like, 
the things that caught fire that we all would hear and would shock us. And I knew the one thing that I was impressed by was seeing her, the Republican debate, take on Trump, and I was pretty impressed by that. And then I was also very impressed that she knew Jaws really well because she used it against this one senator who was like pitching Trump as the shark in Jaws. And at the end of it, she just said, Senator, you know the shark dies at the end of the And it was such a brilliant moment that I was just like, wow, he's got claws. But, um, you know, outside of those things, I really had to go and um, I had to find stuff where she was being interviewed and people asked good questions because she's so good at being a journalist that it's really hard to kind of like get into her. And even listening to her book, which I did a lot just to kind of hear her speech patterns, you don't really get an emotion from her because she's, she's being a journalist when she does the voice uh, reading her book. Um, but it, it became very clear to me the longer, the longer I stayed with the research, the more I could put myself in her shoes. And, and that is that I can relate to being a very ambitious woman and that through my ambition and drive and just my confidence that sometimes people think I'm just a hard bitch. Um, and that those things have been held against me as a negative. And so those things I could very much relate to. And obviously she's a mother and, um, but I think that it's so important for actors to understand circumstance. You know, I think it's so easy for us to say, I wouldn't do that or I wouldn't, kill anybody or I wouldn't do what Megyn Kelly did, but it's, it's, if you can actually put yourself in that person's shoes, I had to understand like her circumstances were so different from Gretchen Carlson. She was like a star there. She was renegotiating her deal there, but more than that, she really liked Roger and she was a victim that definitely struggled with calling him out. And I, I had to, I, I get, I got that. I understood that because I know how hard it is for women sometimes where there's so much stigma around, you know, the fact that they benefited from it or that she, you know, she didn't say anything and she 10 years later was a star and that she still appreciated him and she still went to him for advice and that they had this very close relationship. And those are complicated things that live in such a gray zone for so many women that uh, it took me just it just took me a little longer than a normal character, I guess, for me to get to that place. But she, would, she challenged me, man. I would get there and then something would come out in the news, like the NBC firing, and I was just like, oh! <laughs> Start all over again. <laughs> Jay was incredibly helpful with all of that stuff. If I didn't have a partner in crime like that, I don't, I don't know if I could have gotten through the movie, because the first couple of weeks were really rough. And Jay really... Jay really like took everything that I just emotionally felt so hard and he just brought it into the film and made it part of her story and didn't shy away from it. And it gave me confidence that we were telling the truth, the, the greater truth of her life and not necessarily worrying so much about will people like her? Like that's the last thing I could give a fuck about. You know, are we, are we, are we manipulating something so that it's easier to swallow? Or are we actually doing something that might be a little harder to watch and might ask you to go on a bigger ride and might ask you to work a little harder? Like, that was really how I thought of her. Um, now, you have the most talented uh, group of people behind the scenes, Jay, that you worked with on this movie. And um, from other movies, did you bring them? Have you worked with them before? Or? Yeah, I think every single person on this, except Ellen, did we, we work on which one? No, we didn't work together. Ellen, Ellen's new, El, Ellen, our incredible uh, art director. And <laughs> um, but um, no, Mark, uh, yeah, uh, everybody's, actually, and Renee, I may have, Renee and John and I worked with for many years. Uh, Renee did the, the sound design and was our, our sound, uh, just sound wizard, and John, my editor, yeah. So this is a, we have been together, yeah. And Renee is a pioneer, too, because she's one of the very few women that has been nominated for an Oscar in the sound editing, you know, which was dominated by men, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so, John, uh, John, talk about the film editing here. Then, boy, I mean, just on the surface, but you're going to see a lot of editing here. There's a lot of real footage, a lot of stuff weaved in and out, and all kinds of uh, tricks that we're seeing on the screen here to, to bring it all together. Can you talk about your particular challenges on this? Uh, sure. Most, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that challenging because, I mean, it's going to sound silly, but every performance was so good, and so rich and so many gray areas and so many chances to uh, make people real and see multiple sides of them. And I think that's something I saw when I first read Charles' script. Um, uh, I'm going to reveal a little something about Charles and Jay. They both come not, they, they come from backgrounds that are not completely dissimilar to Kayla's. And um, there are amalgamations of other people. <laughs> uh, they, they brought a perspective that I think was really interesting. You both from conservative family. Yeah. Oh, we were both, sorry, I didn't know. Sorry, you're not going to, you're not revealing anything, don't worry. We lost, um, we lost. It's proudly conservative. Yeah, mind you, we lost, I think, two or three TVs because the bug was burned in, the Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but really, to me, the most interesting thing about the film, I mean, besides the fact that we're obviously meeting all these different women, um, I, mean, I mean, even even the smaller parts like Lily, that there's a pregnant woman there, there's Faye, and all that. But we were, we're in a situation where, even though the film has politics in it, it is really not about politics, it's neutral. And these guys were able to see the humanity in all of these people. And there may have been e easier ways to identify them and put them in little pockets. But really, I think that's a strength here that there, you know, we've, we've obviously had numerous screenings before. But like, like Jay was saying, people get annoyed that, you know, you're liking, making us like Megyn Kelly. But I think from all sides of the spectrum, uh, we've seen people come around. We had a screening in Oklahoma City, which was interesting. These guys went to Boston, which was the friendly place. And um, I, I got elected to go to Oklahoma City with the film. And, and it was fascinating because there were many people on the crew who were like, oh my God, why are you going there? And, and you know, who, who are these people? And they're all the wrong side. And, you know, it seems obvious, but it's really fascinating. They were all human beings who sat in that audience and really enjoyed the film. And when someone asked them, would you recommend it, only, like out of the 20 people in the focus group, only three people said, oh, I would definitely recommend it. And they went, but all 20 of you liked it. And they all started laughing and said, we can't recommend it to our friends or our father-in-law or, or our brother-in-law because they wouldn't like it. And they like Fox News. But they were all human beings and they all came to the film as human beings, and their politics went away. And um, the, the one of um, just just because I have the microphone, the one other thing I want to say is <laughs> the um, you go for it. The character of Rudy Bakhtiar, who is obviously a very small part of the film, to me is one of the most important things in the entire movie. And she's the one who you thought you hear in that scene at the beginning. Yeah. And even before we made the film, Jay was casting, and in order to to show those scenes, um, we had to cut together with the inner voice, cut her character together. And I think the minute I saw that, I realized that this film was taking us to a place that I certainly, as a man who you know has have been has been close to women my whole life and believe I'm pretty aware, had no idea exactly what goes on for a woman in a situation like that. And I, to me, that's the biggest thing. So it was a lot of work, but this is a pleasure, not a challenge. Can I say one thing, just to jump in too humble about one really important thing. The reason John and I work together so much is that I shoot a lot of footage. And Barry is so fast and we're shooting multiple cameras every day. It was a deluge. And John's, what he's, you can tell from how he talks about story, thinks only in terms of performance and story. And so his ability to choose the really amazing parts of what these guys were doing, when I, I would try to get to all the dailies, but I'm also directing the movie, and I would come in on the weekends and go, oh my god, I, I'm going to check a few other takes. And he, I would always come back to the take he chose. His eye for performance and finding 
that soul and what the actor is doing is just, just I, it's amazing what Mr. John Paul can pull off. So that's that's what a great actor. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and another one, I keep thinking of all my favorite scenes here. Another one of my favorite one was the montage of them all getting ready to go on the air. You know, it looked like a Miss America pageant or something in the backstage and changing it. And all of that, you know, which for me, I'm just thinking, wow, Walter Cronkite, we are really removed from that. <laughs> This is a different kind of news. They came into the makeup trailer to chat up through a scene one day and they were putting false lashes on me. He's like, what? Whoa, what are they doing? What are they doing? I was like, chill out, it's false lashes. He's like, this is a sharp pointy thing, like right by your eyeball. And I was like, you have no idea what we do to get all this done. And then you started like really looking into it and shooting all that stuff. It was such like a cool thing on the fly. Men have no idea. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Mark, you and um, Ellen uh, put together this set. Uh, you're recreating uh, Fox News as part of, of what you're doing here. So, what w what went into that preparation for you and that that job, and how much cooperation did you get? You obviously had to go look at it. Uh, well, I only looked at the outside. That was as close as I as I could get. Um, no, we we uh, we really uh, did not. You know, I didn't pursue, didn't expect, or, or, or did, we didn't, you know, get any involved. We had some spies that you talked. We did have some spies. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I'm a New Yorker, so I live, I live there, and I called friends of mine who were in the business and said, you know, anybody in, in Fox News who could get me in there. And it never got that far, and they had also changed the building enough that it wouldn't have sort of behooved me to, to see the details there. But I did get to, to talk to some people and, and got some photographs, and and for me, I think the challenge from the beginning was. Um, I just I, I figured that everybody who had ever, ever worked at Fox News would see this film, and I wanted them to to think how did they get us so right because um, you know some of the challenge was the obvious things was to replicate the sets that everybody knows the, the television sets that's on television every day to the Fox News viewers, but the details of what the actual offices were and and it's it's well written to, uh, Charles had written details in the script. I, I secretly wish we had made it a little crummier than, than what appears on the screen. Although I really didn't want to make it any worse or any better than what you know than what it was. I think we just wanted to make it as absolutely realistic um, in all the locations and the sets, so that you just felt like you were there. Yeah, and it was harder than it, than, it, than it looked. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of work to create those offices. And you all know this: none of it was shot in New York. Every stitch of it was shot in LA. So the magic of, of creation. creation. I think um, probably the hardest part for me was when Mark showed me those photographs and I was like, oh my God, it's dense. <laughs> and it was just piles and piles and piles of um, paperwork. And they used to put their tapes in the U.S. mail boxes, so we ordered a hundred of those and made poster posted things for the sides. And it, it, it looks much more seamless and easier than it really was because we had this feeling of making it as natural and as realistic as we could tell. And just a little while ago, Mark showed me a photograph and I was like, wow, our set looks really great. And he said, no, that's the real Fox. <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding. It's like I couldn't even see the difference anymore. So. Um, it, that part was really fascinating. Um, I had I have to admit, I don't watch Fox News. So when we had to recreate the desks and the tables and the chairs, and I don't know if anybody knows this, but the working title of this was Lucite Desk, which gives you an idea of what we had to go through about desks and legs and things like that. So. Um, they even had little Lucite boxes that they would put the, the newscaster's feet on to get their knees up higher, things like that. So we did a lot of research that maybe is pretty subtle and you're not necessarily seeing it on the screen, but we know it's there. And um, trying to create the characters in all the different uh, bays, and we had two huge floors of those cubicles, and then trying to get some of the character work for all the different O'Reilly and um, Geraldo had that big stuffed teddy bear with his glasses and his mustache. So we really just tried to make it as natural as possible and as 
important as the story is as a woman and being called a bitch at times probably because when you're in a business where you're around a lot of men or you have to be it was a very important story for me and I loved the script and loved working with Jay and thought I this is the first time I've seen it tonight and I thought it was just amazing so proud to be just want to, I'll keep, I just can't, I, need to, I want to say so much about what these guys accomplished, but we had to be able to shoot 360 degrees all the time. Barry doesn't, we don't, we don't shot list with these, this is all performance driven, so Mark and Ellen made it so everywhere we were, we took over the LA Times building and made all those floors uh, into the floors of News Corp, and we, I could shoot anywhere, whatever we came up with. It was ready, you know, because it was really like being in the real place. And and it was just like three, it was, yeah. so sorry, I have to just say something because I was blown away by this as an actor. Okay. Not just 360, but everything was ready for a close up. So when you went into those bays, you were, everything on those pinned walls, like family photos, little notes. Oh my God, the cutest shit that I always wanted to steal. And then I realized, and I was like, no, everybody is stealing it. And we have to keep coming back in here and put it in. But the detail of everything, the post, it's like everything. I even opened drawers and there was yeah. files ready in the it drawers. Like, I thought I was going to catch them there. That was like, oh my crazy. God. Yeah. It was just so impressive. Sorry, Pete. I didn't mean to no, that was, I was just asking about the LA Times. The we had a lot of trips to the 99 cents. <laughs> so I'm just so glad that I'm not the only one. Tell them about the LA Times building, how we, how we got that location and how what you guys decided to do. Yeah, because they moved to El Segundo or something, so it was available. It was empty. It was One of the totally most in amazing things is if anybody has worked there in that the um, I did. atrium, Mark made that the exterior. That was brilliant, I think. that In Rogers, when you see the windows outside, that's really not outside, it's really inside. Yeah. yeah. I spent a lot of time in the LA Times. I actually got locked in there one night because I just, I just wandering around trying to figure it out and everybody left. Um, but it was gutted and empty and he, he created all those floors on multiple floors. It sounds good. like that horror movie, Mute Witness. Does anybody know that movie? Yeah, it's such a great movie that literally said, do you know that you should watch, don't watch it. <laughs> we actually did a Trump's office too. Uh, there, we did way more than was in the movie in a weird sense. Uh, the movie seems like it's so dense, but we even had more. But how the tra tra trajectory of the film went, I understand. We did Murdoch's Boys, The Sun's Office. We did a few other things. I'm sorry. The <laughs> <laughs> sequel. Um, and now, uh, I, I'm a major soundtrack uh, movie music guy, and I have a whole, I told Theodore Shapiro, I have a whole shelf. It's my Theodore Shapiro shelf. I have all of his stuff, including bootlegs. Um, he is a terrific composer. He does all kinds of different movies, comedies, everything. This one, a really wonderful score here, you know, that is is perfectly matched to what we're seeing here, and it was different than things I've seen you do before, actually. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it was Jay and I, um, you know, right after I read Charles's excellent script, I, Jay and I got on the phone, and we both had sort of come to this idea of using women's voices uh, independently, and that was. That was our jumping off point, um, and you know we we felt like it had this potential to, um, you know, carry both the emotion and where necessary the lightness of, of what was happening, and um, and so you know what was nice was that we were starting out just writing a kind of music that I'd never written before, you know, this kind of you know using these sort of syllables in a staccato way and you know I, I just had this idea of what the music could be and and I actually started writing uh, right when they started shooting sort of before I'd seen any footage um, just sort of based on what I was hoping the movie was going to become and um, was just very delighted to engage in this process where I was just sending them a library of music as, as we were going and John Hole was cutting it into the movie and um, you know we ended up sort of finding the tone in this very organic way. I mean even that song, that ha uh, ha uh, ha uh, that's in the teaser and in the elevator scene, he wrote that before we shot it. 
So he, that, composers don't do that. He, he, he channeled the, the script through, and we, we were both influenced by two incredible women, Petra Hayden and Caroline Shaw, who both compose music with only voices, as all, all the instruments are, vo are voiced. They just do all this incredible. And they both, we got them both in to actually do those voices. They, so they're, they're the voices, along with my wife, Susanna Hoffs, who also sings the, ah, ah, that's, that's Sue, yeah, that's Sue's voice. But, they, but Teddy got them in and sampled them and just uh, made their sound into his instruments, which was, that, that just blew me away. And he did all that before we even started, and then we started working in it. But it was, yeah, that's Teddy. That's what he does. How closely do you work with the composer usually, Jay, on, on movies? Uh, with Teddy, incredibly closely. Uh, unlike other composers, I've worked with some great ones. Teddy starts so early and creates suites of music that aren't yet perfectly edited to the scenes, and then we, John uh, starts using them uh, as temp things. I just get them as freestanding bits, but he's thought through what the scene might be like. and. Unlike some composers who just come in at the last minute and watch the film and do the score, this is a this is a year and a half process with Teddy, and we previewed with his music. We don't get stuck with temp music. We previewed with his mock-ups, which are extremely. He actually plays the instruments with a. He's keep doing it on the keyboard, mocking it up with synthesizers, but he'll put a. Is this am I revealing? You do it. I'm not gonna tell. Well, I, I mean, anyway, he he makes them sound human um, himself with the way he mouths the the sound and shapes the sound with his mouth while he's playing the keyboard. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but it's amazing, and we get real mock-ups that sound convincing um, even before we get the score. So it's going on for the whole time. So we're and, 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 and just, just just to but I just reveal a proprietary a secret. Well, no, 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 no. That's, you know, but another thing about the process, Jay, is that you know we started out with this female vocal idea, and we did that for a while, and then you know at a certain point. Jay said, you know, okay, I think we now we need like the music of Fox News. We need a more, you know, masculine sound that's the sort of hard realism of, of how Ailes sees the world. And, and so sort of throughout the process, it was a back and forth where we, you know, figured out a bunch of different kinds of, of themes and tones that we thought the film would need and, and uh, you know, eventually, eventually covered the bases. Yeah. Great job. Uh, and Renee. Hello. Well, it was wonderful to have Teddy's music so early on. I mean, that never happens. You know, it really doesn't. You Very seldom do you get a score when you start. And John said, no, that's the real music. I said, well, I know. But he said, no, that's the music. <laughs> and it was great. So we could start to create our soundtrack with what we what was there. It wasn't like, okay, now this is all gone, and now this is going to be the new soundtrack. Um, and one of the challenges for us was that, you know, a newsroom today is pretty silent. Everyone's on headsets, and they're on computers, and no one's talking on the phones. And it's how really, do you create... It's really scary, actually. Yeah, how do you create, exactly, right? So this is a movie, you can't have that. <laughs> so we had to create these atmospheres. And one of the things we were doing was, we were thinking, you know, one way was that J Jay and Michelle Graham, our, one of the producers, was amazing. They had created, Jay really wanted to have authenticity on all the monitors that are in all the newscasts, in all the, I mean, in all the newsrooms. So you'll see people on monitors, but they had to be what was actually on the, the day that that was happening in the movie. So everything, so the fair use that Jay was talking about, we were given a 225 gig drive and said, here it is, you know. <laughs> and so what we were able to do is to go through that process and, and pick out broadcasts that happened at that day and play them and paste, put them in on people's computers and, and way in the background and and the um, so that that sort of gave us a bed along with you know the wall and the voices that we shot but what we ended up doing was going into a modern office and nowadays what you hear is you know slack which is this inter office and it has all these beeps and sounds and clicks and all kinds of sounds that you've never heard before and computers and phones and cell phones and we would take take them and cut them along with your music and pitch them 
because we're like, if something came up and it was a discordant note, we would then, because we had your music, we could just pitch it and change it. And so there was all these like little things and Jay finally said to me, what? is all that stuff, is that like music, or, uh, it really actually was fun to have that. And Art John, sound editing, which people don't understand what sound editing there's is. There's one, <laughs> one even more meaningful thing that Renee did, um, I, when I first pitched it, I looked at Roger's world as sort of a cult of Roger, where he would sort of cast everybody to fit his look, and, and if you didn't fit, he would squeeze you into that look, but he also, it was almost like he kept them separate from each other. You see it in the animation at the end, that idea of women in a box. And the elevator is that box for me. And she had this incredible sense of it sounding almost like prison doors. Every time the thing, the thing, but it sounds like those holding cells in cop shows when you, and I was like, oh my God, that's, what's, that's what this movie's about, is women trapped, not separated from each other, or if they're, if they're in the same box, they're pitted against each other. And that came out so beautifully uh, with the way Renee found a way to be expressionistic with the sound, not just not just uh, authentic. It's amazing, all of you up here. <laughs> I've done an amazing job. I can't. This movie doesn't open until December, but I can't wait for the conversation. Well, it is starting because you're going out and doing these conversations, and people want to talk about this. Do you find that when you when you go out? Yeah. It, more than anything I think I've ever done, I've never stayed behind at events, <laughs> which is really bad because I don't have a nanny right now and I have to like, wake up at 5.45 every, every morning, but it's been really great because it's, an, it's a conversation that starts with this story because this story is fascinating and then it broadens to personal experience and just where we are socially and culturally right now and where we're going. And that's a big conversation to have. And I've been in rooms after screenings for like two, three hours with people just wanting to talk about it. Um, it's really interesting. It's really nice. It's really nice. A movie that can make a difference. Congratulations and thank you all for coming out here tonight. Thank you. Thank you guys.